More than 2,000 years ago, the legions of Rome ventured from their isolated peninsula and dominated the Mediterranean, the Middle East, and much of Europe for hundreds of years. The political system and ideals spread by the empire have continued to shape the continent of Europe to this very day. Rome may have fallen in AD 476, but the last 1,500 years have been filled with repeated attempts to recreate the essence of the Roman Empire, the unification of the nations of Europe. Napoleon, Charlemagne, and Otto the Great are among the most important figures in European history, ruling vast and powerful empires, sweeping through the continent and striving to bring diverse peoples together under a common banner. Each one saw himself as the natural successor to Augustus, Constantine, and even Julius Caesar. On today's edition of Tomorrow's World, join me as we examine today's efforts to unify Europe, past attempts at reviving the empire, and where it is all headed, the future restoration of Rome. Welcome to Tomorrow's World, where we strive to find the root causes of what's going on in our world today and where current trends are headed. On today's program, we're examining an ideal which has been the driving force of an entire continent for more than 1,500 years. The last two decades have been tumultuous times for Europe, as the continent seems to have been in a constant state of crisis. Recently, Brexit and the potential for more nations to follow Britain's lead in breaking away from the European Union has caused many to question the future of the EU. Whatever may come of the EU, it's vital that we recognize that the idea of a unified Europe goes far deeper than any single organization. Nick Barrett of The Independent describes the role history plays in the current European desire for a united bloc of nations. To understand the continental adherence to a federal Europe, we should perhaps reflect on the long history of the post-Roman West. Century after century, generation after generation, the search for domination through military might has defined the European story, harking back to the good old days of Imperial Rome. While the legions of Rome were feared and achieved stunning military victories, the true legacy of Rome was the ability to absorb former enemies into the expansive empire. Nations of greatly diverse language, religion, and culture operated under the umbrella of the Roman Empire and were welcomed into the fold. Diversity was allowed as long as it did not threaten the unity of the Empire and the primacy of Rome. Today we see attempts to bring nations of diverse language, religion, and culture together once again. Are we indeed headed for a future restoration of the Roman dream? This is not the first time that Europe has sought to reorganize itself. Is the present attempt in the fashion and spirit of Rome? We'll look at six historical attempts to revive the Roman Empire. But first, I want to offer you a special DVD titled The Restoration of Rome. This program is the first time we're offering this DVD, and it's available to you with no charge. It is well worth the minute it takes to pick up the phone and order. As we review the previous restorations of Rome, it's important to note that Christianity had already taken root in the empire before its fall although the Christianity adopted by Constantine bore little resemblance to the Christianity of the first century church. The form of Christianity adopted and spread by the Roman Empire is an element we will see throughout these revivals as it was used as the glue to bind the nations together with common culture and to grant legitimacy to the ruling elites. Less than 100 years after the fall of Rome, the eastern portion of the empire, now branded the Byzantine Empire, would seek to revive Rome's imperial past in what is often referred to as the Imperial Restoration of Justinian. The first restoration of Rome occurred in 554 under Justinian. Ascending to the Byzantine throne in 527, Justinian gave his greatest general, Belisarius, the task of reclaiming the lands previously held by Rome. While he did not reconquer the empire in its entirety, much of North Africa and Italy, including of course the city of Rome itself, were reunified as part of Justinian's revived Roman Empire. One of Justinian's lasting legacies would be his role in establishing the Bishop of Rome as the preeminent leader of the Catholic Church, even appointing three successive popes. 
Justinian's view of church and state as codependent, inseparable pieces are best understood through his own words. There are two great gifts which God in his love for man has granted from on high, the priesthood and the imperial dignity. Justinian's restoration would be short-lived, and it would be nearly 300 years before the next revival of Rome. The second restoration of Rome occurred in the year 800 under Charlemagne. Uniting much of Western Europe, Charlemagne's rule led to the Carolinian Renaissance, a period when literature, architecture, and the sciences flourished. Charlemagne was an ardent supporter of the Catholic Church and felt personally responsible for the spread of his religion. In the winter of 800, Charlemagne traveled to Rome and on Christmas Day knelt in St. Peter's Basilica when a historic event occurred. Pope Leo III took the crown and placed it on Charlemagne's head, giving him the title Imperator Romanorum, translated Emperor of the Romans. His legacy is felt to this day. For those who have revered him as the father of Europe, the greatness of Charlemagne, or Charles the Great, lies in the unifying forces he set in motion when he had himself crowned Holy Roman Emperor in the Eternal City on Christmas Day, 800 CE by Pope Leo III. The idea of Europe's oneness has never quite died. In the next portion of today's program, we will examine four more restorations of the Roman Empire before taking a closer look at the landscape in Europe today. But first, I want to give you an opportunity to request your free copy of today's featured offer, a DVD titled The Restoration of Rome. One of the elements contained on this DVD is a collection of six videos produced by Tomorrow's World Viewpoint, each one going into more detail on the six historic restorations of the Roman Empire. While we are moving quickly on today's program, only spending a few moments on each one, this DVD will more fully cover each of these restorations. Just call the number which will be shown on the screen in a moment, and I'll be right back as we'll look at the next restoration of Rome. Don't miss out on this exciting opportunity. Call the number on your screen and ask for your free copy of The Restoration of Rome or order online at TWCanada.org. This free DVD contains materials never before advertised on Tomorrow's World, and we are happy to send this to you at no cost. Studying the past will help you to understand events unfolding today and into the future. Don't wait, we have operators ready to take your call, or you can order online. If you missed our contact information, don't worry, I'll be back to give it again. Welcome back. On today's program, we're examining one of the keys to understanding Europe's past, present, and future. That's the deep-seated desire to see a renewed Roman Empire. We've looked at two historic restorations of Rome under the leadership of Justinian and Charlemagne. We've also seen the prominence given to the Catholic Church in these restorations to serve as a unifying element for the peoples of Europe. After Charlemagne's death, weak leadership devastated his empire and Europe was again in need of a charismatic ruler. The third restoration of Rome occurred in 962 under Otto the Great. Otto, Duke of Saxony, became known as the protector of Europe, following a decisive victory over the invading Magyars at the Battle of Lechfeld. The papacy had acquired many enemies at this time, and the Pope petitioned Otto for help. Having been rescued by Otto, the Pope then crowned him as the Holy Roman Emperor. Once again, the empire was supported through both imperial and religious measures. Otto unified many of the German-speaking states, and his kingdom is often referred to as the First German Reich. The Fourth Restoration of Rome occurred in 1530 under Charles V. Charles V was crowned King of the Holy Roman Empire in Aachen, Germany, the seat of Charlemagne's realm. He recognized that religion stood as his best opportunity to create a cohesive empire. A fervent Roman Catholic, Charles hoped to unite all Europe in a Christian empire. However, a continent-wide crisis was fermenting, which would cause both church and state to renew their historic interdependence, the Protestant Reformation. Despite Charles' efforts to unify Europe and revive the glory of Rome, religious wars shattered his hopes. Despite this, in 1530, the Pope granted Charles the title he had sought, crowning him Holy Roman Emperor. 
The fifth restoration of Rome occurred in 1804 under Napoleon. This restoration features what is no doubt an attempt to revive Imperial Rome. While Napoleon allowed the Pope to anoint him, he felt that allowing the Pope to crown him would be an indication of Napoleon's subservience to the papacy. Instead, he took the crown, placing it upon his own head while the Pope watched. He is often remembered, rightly so, as one of Europe's greatest generals. His legacy as a statesman should not be overlooked, but his ambitions can be best relayed by two quotes from the man himself. I am a true Roman emperor. I am the best of the Caesars. Tell them that I am Charlemagne, the sword of the church, their emperor. To Napoleon, the idea of unifying Europe in the spirit of the Roman Empire was a very real ambition. The sixth restoration of Rome occurred between 1870 and 1945. Throughout much of the 19th century, Germany and Italy were divided into a number of quarreling small states and principalities. By 1871, Otto von Bismarck had succeeded in uniting all of non-Habsburg Germany. Garibaldi achieved the same goal with Italy. This set the stage for two of recent history's harshest dictators. Mussolini led his fascist party to power in 1922. The party derived its name from the fascis of Imperial Rome and Mussolini's desire to take up the mantle of the Roman Empire is well known. What may not be so well known is that the other European element of the Axis powers, Adolf Hitler, also saw himself as a modern day Caesar and Charlemagne's natural successor. In his mind, Hitler's thousand year Reich would serve as the natural conclusion of a process that he traced back to the coronation of Charlemagne in 800. And so we have, over the course of nearly 1400 years, six attempts to unify the peoples of Europe in successive restorations of the Roman Empire. Justinian, Charlemagne, Otto the Great, Charles V, Napoleon, and the Axis powers use warfare, diplomacy, and the influence of religion to fulfill the European dream. Does this dream live on today? Are we seeing the groundwork laid for a future restoration of Rome? Whether or not the European Union succeeds in becoming the vessel through which the next revival of the Roman Empire occurs is yet to be seen. However, it is the clear direction in which some European states are moving, and either through the EU or some future confederation, it is the desired result. Vaclav Klaus served as President of the Czech Republic from 2003 to 2013. He provides an informed voice regarding the intended direction of the EU. In an interview for Der Spiegel, he made some remarkable observations. The development of European integration can be divided into two phases. The first era ended with the Maastricht Treaty. It was a liberalization phase with the main goal of European integration at the time being the removal of various barriers and borders in Europe. But the second phase is a homogenization or standardization phase, one that involves regulation from the top and growing control over our lives. One of the goals of the EU has been to encourage Germans, Greeks, Spaniards, and Lithuanians to no longer see themselves as such, but as Europeans. It appears as though they have little choice in the matter. Commenting on the EU ignoring results of popular votes, Klaus declared, The purpose of the Constitution was to take a step in the direction of a unification process. It failed. The supporters of a united Europe were in shock and practically paralyzed in the first few days following the French and Dutch referendums. But then they quickly realized that they could continue to pursue their original goals and intentions even without a constitution. With each day that passes, Brussels puts out new laws, new initiatives, and new guidelines, all of which are forcing us in the direction of unification. History has a way of repeating itself, and European history points to yet another future effort to coalesce into a superpower in the Roman style. In the next portion of our program, we will look to another source, recorded during the height of the original Roman Empire, which indicated that revivals of this empire would dominate Europe on seven occasions, six of which we've already seen. 
In just a few moments, we'll look to the Bible to see a remarkable prophecy that has described the last 1,500 years of European history with precision. But first, I want to remind you of our free DVD, The Restoration of Rome. This DVD includes a Tomorrow's World telecast presented by Gerald Weston, where he spends his entire duration digging into the prophecies we'll be covering in the next portion of today's program. You don't want to miss out on your free copy of The Restoration of Rome. To request your free copy, call the number on your screen and ask for the DVD on the Restoration of Rome, or order online at TWCanada.org. Have you ever asked, where is the world headed? Or what does the future hold for me? Tomorrow's World magazine answers these questions and more, and will also be sent to you free of charge. Call us right now or visit us online to get your free copy of the Restoration of Rome and Tomorrow's World magazine. Enjoy the rest of today's program. Welcome back to Tomorrow's World. Today we're looking at the quest for European unity, past, present, and future. We've already seen six revivals of the Roman Empire and established that there is still a longing on the continent to establish a unified body for the peoples of Europe. Before the break, I mentioned that Bible prophecy predicted each of those six revivals and declares emphatically that there is yet one more to come. This is actually covered more than once in Scripture, first being mentioned in a 2,500-year-old writing of the Jewish prophet Daniel. The king of Babylon had a dream that no one but Daniel could interpret. You can read the story in Daniel chapter 2. Nebuchadnezzar dreamed of a great image with a head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, and legs of iron. The Bible shows that these four sections represented four successive empires that would dominate the Middle East and Mediterranean areas. In order, they were Babylon, Persia, Greece, and then Rome. However, the prophecy specifically refers to the feet and toes of the statue, being made partly of iron and partly of a poor quality of clay. The image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. The scripture goes on to say that in the days of these kings, represented by the ten toes, a great stone from heaven, Jesus Christ, would destroy these kings and begin his rule on the earth. These same empires are described again later in Daniel. In chapter 7, God uses beasts to represent the successive empires of Babylon, a lion, Persia, a bear, Greco-Macedonia, a four-headed leopard, and then a different and indescribable beast, Rome. Let's now turn to the book of Revelation, which was recorded while the Roman Empire still appeared to be unending. Revelation 17 contains vital information regarding this beast power. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. After further describing this woman, John gives more detail concerning the beast. The beast that you saw was and is not, and those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they see the beast that was, and is not, and yet is. An empire that was, and is not, yet somehow still is. This only makes sense as a past empire which has fallen, and yet has been re-established in another form, just like the restorations of Rome we've been discussing. Moreover, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings, five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. Mountains are also often used to represent kingdoms. Daniel 2 and Isaiah 2 are examples to consider. It is also interesting to realize that the city of Rome is known for having the seven hills of Rome. Notice that these kingdoms do not exist all at once. They are successive kingdoms. This is in contrast to ten additional kings, which are represented by the beast's ten horns. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings, who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. 
These are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. The seven heads represent seven successive restorations of this beast power. The ten horns represent ten kings who reign simultaneously at some point in the future. These ten kings give their power over to the beast, the revived empire, for a time. We know this is part of the final restoration, the future restoration that we are keying on today, because just as the seventh head represents a king which has not yet come, these ten horns represent ten kings who have not yet been given power. They are the same ten kings we saw represented by the ten toes on the statue in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. We know these prophecies both point to the same revival of the Roman Empire and that they point to a future event because both prophecies include something that has not yet occurred. Daniel 2 and verse 44. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Likewise, we see the beast of Revelation fighting against Jesus Christ at his return. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Unless there are two world-dominating, ten-nation confederations operating at the return of Christ, these prophecies describe the same empire. And unless Christ has already returned, the seventh restoration of Rome is a future one. Ten nations giving up authority to an empirical power. Is this not a fulfillment of what Europe is trying to do now? Consider this quote from Jeremy Rifkin's work, The European Dream. At each turning point in the 55-year development of the Union, the nations and peoples of Europe have narrowly voted yes to a rewriting of the political contract, conferring more authority to the Union while giving up an increasing share of their national sovereignty in the process. This is not to say that the EU is destined to be the future revival. That remains to be seen. The point, however, is that we can already see Europe trending in this direction. The EU, with its 27 member nations, would have to undergo significant changes to become this ten-nation end-time power. We may not know what twists and turns it will take along the way, but Bible prophecy is clear, and both history and the current political climate support that a future restoration of Rome will occur. If the beast is representative of seven successive revivals of the Roman Empire, what should we make of the woman who was riding the beast? Let's go back to Revelation 17. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Verse 11 informs us that these waters upon which the woman sits represent peoples, multitudes, nations, and different languages. We see here a force which exerts control over many different nations, peoples, and tongues, which has dealings with political leaders and acts as a guiding force. Did we see a guiding force at work with the previous restorations of the Roman Empire? Yes, we certainly did. We should also notice that the Bible often uses a woman to refer to the Church of God. You can see this in Revelation 12 as well as Ephesians 5. However, this woman is referred to as a harlot, a false church. Brent Nelson and James Guth authored a book titled Religion and the Struggle for European Union, arguing that religion has played a major role in shaping the current union. When asked what aspect of Catholicism in particular promotes support for the EU, the answer was telling. Catholicism has always been a universal religion. It was the successor to the Roman Empire, and in Catholic theology and ideology, there's always been an emphasis on the unity of Christendom. Even today, even though the Pope doesn't claim secular authority, there's still supranational governance within the Roman Catholic Church. So Catholics have always been very comfortable, even if subconsciously, with the notion of supranational governance. 
Reuters reported on several statements made by the current Pope, calling once again for the peoples of Europe to unite. Pope Francis made an impassioned plea for Europe to stick together and revive the ideals of its founders. He said Europe had to again take up the mysticism of its founding fathers and overcome divisions and borders. No, we don't know all the details of how this future restoration of the Roman Empire will come to pass. But scripture is clear that at some point shortly before the return of Jesus Christ, a group of ten nations will give up their sovereignty, their authority to a charismatic leader who will use his power to inflict destruction on an unprecedented scale. We also know that this coming beast power will have a symbiotic relationship with a great false church. Most importantly, we also know the end of the story. The seventh restoration of the Roman Empire will be the last. Revelation records the inspiring announcement that will be made at the return of Christ, declaring that the kingdoms of this world, including the revived Roman Empire, would be overthrown in favor of the perfect government of Jesus Christ. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. While the destruction wrought by this final revival of the Roman Empire will be unparalleled in human history, God will not allow it to continue. He will put an end to all tyrannies and dictatorships by sending His Son to restore order to a chaotic world. That is the good news of tomorrow's world. Be sure to take just a few moments and order your free DVD, The Restoration of Rome. We don't charge for this material because we don't believe the truth should be sold. From all of us here at Tomorrow's World, thank you for joining us. I hope you found the material covered in today's program to be valuable. Watch events in Europe, but take comfort in knowing the end of the story. Search Tomorrow's World on YouTube and click subscribe to watch our telecasts online, as well as our short video answers to biblical questions on Tomorrow's World Answers. Be sure to tune in next week, same time and same station, as Gerald Weston, Stuart Wachowicz and I will continue to provide insight into current events and bring you the wonderful news of tomorrow's world. To learn more about today's topic, visit TWCanada.org. You can also order by calling us at 1-866-784-7895 or by writing us at Tomorrow's World P.O. Box 409, Mississauga, Ontario, L5M0P6. You will also receive a free subscription to Tomorrow's World magazine, revealing God's principles for leading an abundant and happy life, while providing insight into current and future events. At our website, you can also watch this and many more Tomorrow's World programs. Call 1-866-784-784. 7895. Write or visit us online today. This program is a production of The Living Church of God.